Well, good morning, everyone. We are back from our two-week recess, all charged up, ready to go. Welcome to the issues and updates for the Clackamas County Board of Commissioners. County Administrator Gary Schmidt, you're up. Thank you, Chair Smith. Uh, we have a full agenda for you, Commissioners. We saved all the exciting topics until you returned. The plan is to have this first session until noon today and then reconvene at 1.30 p.m. today to finish the list. Uh, because we're starting a little bit earlier than expected, not everyone is here yet, so I will rotate through the agenda uh, with those who are here. We will, though, start with the development agency. Chair, if you would please convene as the development agency. I now recess as the Board of County Commissioners and convene as a development agency. Commissioners, you are now meeting as a development agency, and there is a request for consent agenda item for the development agency. It is approval of amendment number two to the contract with Harper Hauf Peterson Regellis for the Linwood Avenue Improvement Project. The amendment adds $343,733.92 for a new total contract value of $1,676,077.82. Funding is through the Clackamas County Development Agency, North Clackamas Revitalization Area Urban Renewal District. No county general funds are involved. Dan Johnson is the Director of Transportation and Development. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Smith. Commissioners, welcome back. Um, what you have is an amendment uh, to a contract with HHPR, which is Hoff, Harper Hoff, Peterson, Regalis. Um, essentially, they are currently under contract to develop design and construction documents for this project. Essentially, what this um, second amendment does is a couple of things, one of which is um, accommodates some changes and or adjustments uh, that were requested um, by Water Environment Services and also Clackamas River Water. Both of those are creditable back to us um, as dollars um, back to the development agency. So basically reimbursement, um, but essentially, and some additional requirements from our engineering department in regards to additional widening and turn lanes that were required as a part of this project when they did the review. Um, and last but not least, it does extend the timeline of the contract. Um, we are not, um, we do not, uh, um, bring these amendments forward lightly. Um, this is a pretty substantial one, a pretty substantial increase, but it is um, substantial in regards to the fact that it provides additional services from HHPR uh, in regards to additional right-of-way services, uh, drawing services and coordination services to advance this project. I'd be ha happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Yeah, I do. Oh. Have a question. So, Dan, uh, just so I, there's been a, a lot of work done on Lin Linwood Avenue mm -hmm. on the south end. So is this work on the north end where there's have been no improvements? You say north. Well, north maybe, I guess. Kind of west, west northwestish. Uh, closer to the Portland, Portland County, the Portland uh, yes. city of Portland. Yes, line. I believe, so. yes. So it's an unimproved area. Correct. So it'll be the same type of roadway improvements that are similar to the work that's already been done we're, on Linwood? We're tying in those improvements, essentially coordination with Milwaukee as well, because they have improvements along that corridor. And so it's it's basically extending a lot of those improvements down through the unincorporated area of Clackamas County. Right. And, and have all those properties been sewered? <coughs> Uh, I don't I don't know that for a fact, but utility relocation and our extension, we still have our programs in place. Um, if you recall, we did um, the North Clackamas revitalization area has a lot of programmatic components to it. So we have, for example, the sewer extension service program and things of that nature. So if there's an interest in extending, um, but that's a discussion I'd have. I, I, I doubt it, to be honest, that all of them are, um, but it's a discussion we can have with our, our PM to see if we want to do some advanced outreach before we cut that road up again. But that was one of the key core missions of that district. It though. was. Yeah. And so okay. the, the first project out of the gate was coordination with Water Environment Services to extend all the sewer to that area in, in Milwaukee, because the, the district boundary goes into the city a little bit, and for the unincorporated areas. Um, and then secondly, develop those programs for extension of those services to the property owners, um, that those, those property owners that could qualify, those of lesser means that could qualify for those programs. Yeah, my, my last comment on this, my concern is that is that um, if we're making all these improvements similar to what's already been done, I would hate to see the road tore up a year, yeah. two years from now, if someone's septic fails yeah. and got to tear the road up to put the sewer in. <coughs> Correct. So I'd have to follow up with the PM about that. Okay. And I mean, essentially, you're seeing that kind of discussion go on, going on throughout all of our all of our roadways because we have now advanced plans in regards to our capital and our and our um, rehabilitation. In fact, we're going to talk to the board at some point in time about a no cut policy in some of our roadways to keep those roads oh nice can, um, at a higher quality for a longer period of time. But that's a discussion for another day. Right. Right. Yeah. Any objections to this moving forward? Seeing none. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. 
Chair, would you now reconvene as the Board of County Commissioners? I will recess as a development agency and convene as a Board of County Commissioners. Thank you. Uh, not everyone is here yet for the consent agenda, so I'm going to rotate through the agenda. Apologies for that, but we'll start with those who are here. So the first item would be approval of Emergency Preparedness Council bylaws. Daniel Nybauer is Interim Director of Disaster Management. There was a memo with the draft bylaws in your packet. Uh, Daniel, please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, this is for approval of the Emergency Preparedness Council bylaws. They have been reviewed by County Council and by the Emergency Preparedness uh, Council. So we are uh, coming to you for your approval. I have a brief summary here. Uh, as we've stated, in, uh, as you are aware, the Council is uh, here to review and offer advice to Disaster Management and the Board of County Commissioners. We have 15 voting members and nine ex officio members. There is a chairperson, vice chairperson, and secretary as part of that. And there are currently five subcommittees uh, under the Council of Communication, Community Preparedness, Logistics, Resources, and Recovery that will be determining specific issues that they would like to work on. Any questions? Um, thank you for this um, really good work on this issue. It's very important. And it's uh, good to know that our Emergency Preparedness Council is engaged in going forward. Another subcommittee meeting is coming up shortly, I believe, today? Uh, yes, there's one today yeah. at 1 o'clock. Uh, we will, this board will be engaged in a House District 2 52 appointment process, so unfortunately we can't attend. But we'll, we'll get there on, on our other meetings. Uh, I do appreciate the volunteer efforts and your efforts as well to get the bylaws done on this. Any comments on this going forward? Any objections? So great. No, just this wonderful. This is just such great work. And I have been uh, listening in on the work of the council, and, and it's just been wonderful. Such expertise. Great job um, finding folks, and great job for this board appointing such a wonderful council. So thank you. Seeing no objections, thank you, Daniel. So we would seek a motion to approve, and we can do it right here today. Oh, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Commissioner Fisher has moved that we approve the bylaws for the Emergency Preparedness Council. Commissioner Schrader has seconded that motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Shannon, would you please take the poll? Commissioner Savas? Aye. Commissioner Scholl? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Chair Smith? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, secure rural schools payment election process. Dan, Johns Dan Johnson and Mike Besner from Transportation and Development will present. There was also a memo in your packet. You've discussed this before. There is a deadline coming up at the end of this month, which is why we're before you again today. So Dan and Mike, uh, <laughs> go ahead, please. Uh, good morning again, uh, Commission. Uh, we are here to talk about secure rural schools. Um, You've heard this discussion to some extent back in August. Um, we're going to give you just a general breakdown of this discussion uh, going forward. In short, um, in 2000, um, Wyden basically approved the Secure Rural Schools discussion for funding for rural counties. Okay, uh, That discussion um, considers um, U.S. Forest Service land, number one, and considers what's called ONC lands, number two. Mm -hmm. um, the Secure Rural Schools um, discussion was reauthorized as a part of the 2021 Federal Infrastructure um, Package. However, this new reauthorization requires counties to do two things. One, to have a discussion around the distribution percentages for those dollars for U.S. Forest Service and the ONC lands. And then two, to have a discussion, which that decision isn't due yet, that's not due till August of next year, to have a discussion on the methodology in which we wish to use um, for payment of those dollars. We're here today to simply have a discussion around the distribution percentages. So if you look at um, page two of your report, mm -hmm. You're going to see, basically, we provided a column there. So they break down into the U.S. Forest Service lands and the ONC lands. They have what are called titles that basically are those areas which those dollars would go to fund. You have the percentages column, which those are our current percentages. 
And then you have percentage limits, which are basically, basically the parameters in which the statute allows those percentages to be adjusted back and forth, okay? Um, staff has reviewed this, and there's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, basically, uh, Title I and Title III items are direct distributions to the county. We control those dollars, okay? So if, and so our thought is um, the reasoned approach is to take and retain local control of those dollars on how they're being distributed. If we change the percentages for Title I or Title III and increase Title II, those go essentially to the U.S. Treasury. And then, so those dollars are no longer in our control, they go to the federal government, and then we, in theory, have to, we can apply for grants and things like that to secure those dollars. There's no guarantee that we would be able to secure those dollars and those monies, okay? So essentially what you have is a recommendation from staff. And so having that nuance that we prefer to keep those dollars as a direct distribution to Clackamas County and those dollars go into, for like Title I and Title III, um, for U.S. Forest Service, it's transportation and it's disaster management. Uh, for ONC lands, it's a direct general fund distribution and then also some disaster management funding as well. Uh, so the options for the board to consider today are one, uh, retain the current SRS distributions as they're identified in here, which maximize those dollars coming to Clackamas County directly. Or two, um, provide staff direction on adjustments you'd like to see um, to those basic percentages. Our recommendation to the board is basically to keep those percentages the way they are currently. Um, that uh, we, we're getting similar information from our advisors um, with ONC, and that recommendation has been made to a wide variety of entities they're applying for these dollars as a whole. So Mike Besner and I are here to answer any questions you might have. Um, this is something you don't deal with often, especially this election process is new, and it came out of this current bill. Uh, so we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. So basically, they've changed the funding scenario a little bit. They've created more decisions to take place. And that funding scenario is basically that next decision that we have to make, not we, you have to make in August. Because that's around the methodology. And that gets a little more murkier about, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's timber receipts versus the secure rural schools methodology. Yeah, you know, they, I don't think they changed it. We may, probably made this election like 20 years ago. And well, the new law says we want you to just say that you want to keep it the way it is or change it again. So uh, how many times will we have to make this decision? If we make this decision now, do we have to come back next year and make another decision? I don't think it happens that often, but it all depends on Congress and the laws they pass. Okay. All righty. Uh, questions and comments from commissioners? Commissioner Scholl. Yeah, we had a choice of selecting percent of harvest receipts or SRS. And SRS, uh, according to other folks on the board of the Association of Oregon and California Counties, all say that the secure rural schools option is going to be the more lucrative in the coming years. So I, I uh, support that. And the breakdown of the percentages, that's what we had before. And I recommend we stay with that. Thank you. And I, I, if I could respond to that briefly, mm -hmm. there was a lot of confusion when we were back here, because we had this talk about the methodology with you in August. Yes. In we fact, did. when we were here talking to you, they dropped the fact that, no, it's not even numbered years. You've got to make that decision. It's odd number years. And so here we are. And so basically, we tabled that decision that you had made with a commitment to come back to you again before August and just reaffirm if that methodology is the SRS methodology or the timber receipts methodology. And we'll bring more information forward before August to have that discussion. Okay, there's a staff recommendation to accept option one. Do we do that today, Gary? And do we entertain a motion? Yes, so yes to both, please. Okay. Second. Commissioner Savas has moved that we retain the current SRS distribution percentages, Title I, Title II, and Title III, as presented in the staff report. Commissioner Schrader has seconded that motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Shannon, please take the poll. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Scholl? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Chair Smith? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much for the presentation today. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Thank you. Chair. Next, we uh, will. Commissioner Shaw. Chair, I got a question. Uh, gentlemen, who's going to sign off on the form that that's that, yeah. this form that's in here that we sent in to uh, the feds? Who's the, who does that? We're coordinating our information um, through the Association of okay. Counties um, for a master submittal. Got it. And there okay. may have to be some authorization, but that um, we'll have to confirm. And you're going to do that this week? Well, we're going to do it as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay. I think you. the deadline's on the 19th. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you very there's much. A yeah. signature if there's a signature required, we'll have Chair Smith sign it. Thank that you. Would make sense. Thank you. Gary, what's All right, up moving next? Moving on. Next, request for a public hearing for COVID 19 impact assistance for child care. Grant, Rod Cook, Director of Health, Housing, Human Services, will present. There was a memo in your packet. Go ahead, Rod. Okay. Yes, um, this is a request for a public hearing uh, to inform an application for COVID-19 impact assistance for child care grant for business from Business Oregon. Um, we respectfully request the board hold the required public hearing in September and preferably by September 22nd, 2022, so that staff may submit the final grant application. This is just part of the grant application process. We're coming before you today to set up our uh, proposed uh, hearing date. Any questions on this? Commissioner Scholl. Uh, Mr. Cook, uh, this 250K, is that going to going to existing child care facilities in the county or is it going to go to something new i'm not sure all that that's been worked out but it's basically to find parents who need assistance with their child care and we're going to try to see if we can get them some subsidies around their child care needs that may be identifying a child care provider who who knows that list of eligible parents or it might be us going out and finding those parents and uh, helping them with their child care costs. Yeah, okay. okay, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing no objections. So we'll, with your permission, we'll schedule that for a hearing on Sept Thursday, September 22nd at your regular business meeting. Thank you very much, Rod. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rod. You can stick around, Rod. Next item, Workforce Ready Grant Application Amendment. Uh, Rod will also present. There was a memo in your packet. Go ahead, Rod. Yes, the board originally uh, approved this grant application on um, August 11th. We inadvertently left out a document, the attachment D, that should have been in the packet for your review. And so we're simply bringing this back before you so we can uh, resubmit that uh, with the, the total application intact. So is that, that application or attachment D? Yes. Is that, I'm looking at that. and. Uh, uh, commissioners, do you have any questions about attachment D in the packet? Seeing none, and what is the action taken on this? We Here. will, once uh, you approve, we will give it to you for signature, and then we'll resubmit that application. Gary, do we need a motion? I would ask for a formal motion, please, for the record. Yes. So moved. Second. Commissioner Fisher has moved that we accept attachment D to the application certification certification sheet for a grant application for workforce ready grants round one commissioner schrader has second that motion any further discussion seeing none shannon please call the poll commissioner savis aye commissioner Schull. aye commissioner schrader aye commissioner fisher aye chair smith aye motion passes five zero thank you rod thank you commissioners Thank you very much. Uh, next, review of your business meeting agenda for this Thursday, September 8, 2022, at 10 a.m. You'll have a public hearing, which is a second reading of an ordinance that would repeal Chapter 8.10 short-term rentals. So that is your second reading on that topic. You have all the consent agenda items that you have not yet discussed today, but we'll do that shortly. And that is your meeting agenda. If you have any questions, please let me know prior to Thursday, and you're happy to answer them for you. Next, advisory board and commission appointments. Shannon, go ahead, please. We just have one for you today. The Community Road Fund Advisory Committee, staffed by the Department of Transportation and Development, currently has five openings due to term expirations. A total of 15 members are allowed with three-year terms. Through the recruitment process, four applications were received and four are recommended to be appointed. The recommendation is as follows. Sedomir Jessick, Stephen Jonkus, James Pritchard, Marg Stewart. I'll accept a motion to accept. 
I'm move sorry. to accept. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, Commissioner Schrader has moved to accept the nominations for the Community Road Advisory Committee, and Commissioner Shaw has second that. Any further discussion? I'm <coughs> sorry, I interrupted, Commissioner. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> all anxious to get the work done. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, no further discussion. Shannon, please take the poll. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Scholl? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Chair Smith? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. All right, I'm moving back to the top of the agenda now, a, a Violence Against Women grant application from the District Attorney's Office. Uh, I see Carrie Walker is here. I'll ask her to please come forward. Uh, this is a request for your a consent agenda item, but we, uh, we missed the deadline. That's why we're, we're separating it out. No, no worries. Uh, but Carrie, I think this may be your first time. Uh, Carrie Walker from the District Attorney's Office, can you give like a one minute high level overview of the request? Please, please? introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. I'm Carrie Walker. I'm the Director of the Victims Assistance Program within the District Attorney's Office. I occasionally come and ask your, your permission to apply for grants, which fund the majority of our positions in, the, in our Victims Assistance Program. Mm -hmm. And what I'm asking for today is permission to apply for a Violence Against Women, Stop, Stop Violence Against Women competitive grant, which is targeted towards prosecution offices to enhance their services to victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and dating violence. It would be a three-year grant with a maximum of $400,000 dollars available to our office which would fund additional positions with that work with the Family Justice Center as well as a coordinator to uh, improve our response to sexual assault victims specifically through our sexual assault response team any questions or comments on this Yeah, I, I do so is has this grant been awarded before are we hiring a new FTE for example for this so we do not, we have not uh, applied for this grant in the recent past. So this would be a new funds for our office. Because it's a limited, it's a three year grant, with, we wouldn't be able to guarantee positions. So we would be hiring for limited term positions to, to be paid through the grant funds for as long as they're available. Okay, so it's under those terms. I'd just be concerned about it being one time funded as it says, and then being left with the services not being there thereafter, obviously. so. Yeah. Just concerned that we're building, you know, the service and then yeah. psh, it stops. Definitely. And, I, and it, VAWA, VAWA issues grant applications on a regular basis, and so it could potentially be continuing funds through them, but not being able to guarantee that it would be a limited term, limited terms positions within our office. All right. Okay, Gary, do we need to entertain a motion or just go on consent no, agenda like you consent said? Consent agenda for this okay, Thursday. that's very fine. Thank you for uh, watching out for these important grants. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. All right, we will now go to the consent agenda items because the, most of the people are here now. We'll start with elected officials and the assessor will be first. Item one, approval of a resolution authorizing an application process from 2021 House Bill 2247 to waive interest charges on unpaid or late ad valorem property tax payments for 2020-2021 property tax year for qualifying businesses. Uh, Bronson Rueda is the county assessor. Welcome and go ahead. Thank you, Gary. Good morning, Chair Smith, members of the board. I am here today to discuss a couple items. As Gary mentioned, the first House Bill 2247 from the 2021 legislative session which allows a county to waive interest charges on property taxes for the 2021 property tax year for qualifying businesses, businesses only. My department brought this issue before you on November 2nd, 2021, and the board voted to adopt a county resolution authorizing the application and approval process per House Bill 2247. PGA did a great job crafting the application which is attached. Once the resolution, resolution is signed, my department can put the application on our homepage and forward any applications we receive to the board to approve or deny. If the application is denied by the board, an appeal can be made to my department, then my decision will be, will be final and not appealable. I respectfully recommend the board approve the resolution and application associated with 2021 House Bill 2247. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions or comments regarding this? I think uh, we need to entertain a motion. No, this would be for this Thursday's business meeting. Oh, I see. Okay. On uh, a discussion item? Uh, it'd be on a consent agenda, oh, unless consent you want agenda. it. Consent agenda. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Uh, did, we, did, did we ever have anybody take advantage of the program offered up in this House bill? The only other county to 
um, have a resolution was Lynn County and no one applied in Lynn and County. And no one applied at Clackamas County either? There hasn't been an application yet um, oh, out see. there, and so this will be the first time it's out there, but nobody has inquired about it. And there's only 90 days from when the resolution is signed for the application period, then it's over. Well, I stand corrected. I thought we had already done this. It seems like we t have talked about this a lot. I thought we'd already put this out there. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, just a question. Are we coordinating with our chambers so we get the word out that the 90 days will be available so businesses can apply? We can talk about what kind of coordination we need to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, that would be probably a good thing to do with PGA and our economic development folks just to have the, make sure people know. Because we'll get I'm, the word out widely, yes. Yeah, absolutely. thank you. Thank you. Bronson for this. Right. You're welcome. And okay. see no further objections on this. Uh, what's next? Um, item two from the assessor also, approval of a board order authorizing the cancellation of delinquent prop personal property and manufactured structure property tax accounts. Okay. So the second item concerns are uncollectible business and manufactured structure personal property accounts. The list you have are the accounts we have determined to be uncollectible. For business personal property, there's a total of $153,720.51 of uncollectible tax. And for manufactured structure personal property, there's a total of $11,242.48 of uncollectible tax. The total of both is $164,970.99. Um, this is over a period of the last 20 years. I recommend uh, signing the board order approving my department to cancel the uncollectible accounts. Right. Commissioner Frischer. Yeah, just a quick question. That seems like a really small amount for over 20 years, but what deems an account uncollectible? So in your packet, there is a list of 10 items for business personal property and eight items for manufactured structures that, that we've come up with to determine if something's uncollectible. I will note for business personal property, the most common reasons, there's two of them, is one, the company is no longer in business or the corporation was dissolved. And for manufactured structure personal property, there's one main reason, and that is the structure was destroyed, we were not notified, and so taxes continue to accrue mm -hmm. and the unit has no value. Mm -hmm. So once we find out it was destroyed at a later date, then we determine it's not collectible. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. And there is a list of mm -hmm. in our packet and it's good to uh, differentiate that. Any further questions about this item? Seeing none, go ahead. Uh, that's all from the assessor. So we'll put this on this Thursday's business meet, tomorrow's business meeting agenda. Thank you, Bronson. Um, Thank you. I, I don't see a rep from the sheriff's office, so we'll come back to the item number three. Moving on, county administration. Item one, approval of a funding agreement between Clackamas County and Clackamas County Historical Society, Museum of the Oregon Territory. Total agreement value is $100,000. Budgeted, funded <coughs> through budgeted county general funds. Nancy Bush is county operating officer. Go ahead. Good morning, commissioners. So uh, this is $100,000, as Gary said, that was approved through the budget process. This is for Moot, for the Missouri, I'm sorry, the Missouri, wow. Um, the Museum of, um, uh, I'm sorry, Oregon Territories. Um, and this is going to be used for their operations budget. Any questions or comments? Mr. Schrader. Yeah, do they have a new executive director at this point? They do. They just hired one just a few, uh, I think, in June. Okay. I think he started in June. So they do have someone there who's going to be operationalizing yes. more of the yes. events and all, all the other kinds of things that Yes, that now. is correct. Okay. I see a name here. Uh, yes. Stephen Greenwood? Yes. Okay. Yes. Very good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, any objections to this moving forward? No. Seeing none. All right, item two, approval of a funding agreement between Clackamas County and the Clackamas County Arts Alliance. Total agreement value is $100,000, funded through budgeted county general funds. So this too uh, was approved during the budget period um, for this current fiscal year. These dollars will be used here in Clackamas County for arts programs and projects. Any questions about this? We approve this in the budget and this is the agreement that follows. Any objections? Seeing none. Okay, 
Thank you. Next, Finance Department, Item 1, Approval of a Resolution Transferring Appropriations Within Health, Housing, and Human Services in Accordance with Local Budget Law. The transfer value is $33,219,000. Funding is through Metro Supportive Housing Service Funds, the District Attorney's Office Appropriated Funds, and $1.2 million in budgeted county general funds. Uh, Ed Johnson is Deputy Director of uh, uh, Finance Department. And Rod Cook is the Director of Health, Housing, and Human Services. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. So before you have a resolution um, which seeks to have the Health, Housing, and Human Services Department transfer appropriations, $33,219,000 from the Health, Housing, and Human Services Administration line of business to the Housing and Community Development, a newly created um, line of business. As the county administrator explained, it's the line share of it, 32 million is supportive housing services funding, and then 1.2 is affordable housing general fund appropriations, and then the remaining is 19,000 from the DA's office. Um, periodically, a department um, may seek to transfer appropriations between a fund or between um, programs in order to align those dollars appropriately so that they can track and report on those on those dollars on those on the funds and that is what we're trying to accomplish pretty much bring to your attention that this is what h3s is planning to do um, just make a it's, do some housekeeping as you, they Gary Schmidt, you have a comment. Yes, uh, commissioners, this this is only a housekeeping item. We've talked with you. I've talked with you previously. This is something you had recommended and requested, and Rod agreed. He's creating a housing division within H3S mm -hmm. to put all of the county's housing efforts together. The housing authority, our social services work related to housing, homelessness, everything will now be together in a new division of health, housing, and human services. And this is simply making sure all the budget lines are appropriately accounting for that. That's all that this is. Thank you. Very good. Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, I'm just interested in what the district attorney um, dollars are allocated for programmatically. I think they go towards, so it's part of the... Is it the lead? That's yes, the lead funding. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. That's good. good enough answer for me. <laughs> Commissioner Savas. Yeah, uh, so will, will we be doing this every year? Uh, I, I do know the lion's share of that money came in recently. So we do it as, a, as it comes in, in one lump sum, or we'll be doing it monthly as these allocations are distributed. Once the account, and the account string has been set up, so the new line of business has been created, therefore when the dollars, when they hit our bank, they'll be transferred to the appropriate account string to the correct division, which will be the housing and community development. So okay. there shouldn't be a problem going forward. So you won't be back here again, they'll be automatic? Exactly. Okay, okay. So okay, just great. update the deposit form okay, great. internal Thank process. You. Commissioner Scholl. Yes, uh, gentlemen, is this reorganization uh, growing FTEs or are you keeping the current number to do this? There was some uh, new uh, FTE as it relates to the supportive housing services because that's a brand new program that we're putting online. The rest is uh, we've actually eliminated uh, some positions in the total merger. Okay, good. Thank you. Any questions? I see no objections for this moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, Rod? I was just going to say thank you for your vision on bringing all this into one, under one umbrella. That's thank really You bet. Wise. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, uh, also under finance, item two, approval of a resolution acknowledging a significant deficiency in internal control over compliance for fiscal year 2021 and describing corrective action in accordance with ORS 297.466. So, Ed, introduce uh, your uh, colleague. Go ahead, Ed. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, yeah, so I have um, Joseph Rosevere, who is a grants manager in county finance, and I will turn it over to Joseph to present. Great. Thank you, Ed. My name is Joseph Rosevere. I'm the grants manager for the county. Um, we're before you to respectfully recommend the Board of County Commissioners adopt a resolution acknowledging two significant deficiencies for federal awards around internal controls for our audit, single audit for the year ending June 30, 2021 in there. Um, the Oregon statute requires consideration of measures necessary to address 
as well as adopting corrective action plan and a timeline for addressing in there. I'd be happy to give any information related to the findings specifically, as well as our corrective action taken, if helpful, for the commission. So yes, Joseph, will you tell them what, we briefed you on this before, commissioners. Yes, this is not news to you, I hope. Uh, can you tell them it was regarding water, water environment um, services, correct? There were, uh, for the, the significant deficiency in federal programs, there were two programs that had significant deficiencies in there. One was the Community Development Block Grant, Entitlement Grants Cluster. The condition was the auditors identified three timesheets that did not have appropriate approval of the selected time card. So the, the cause is the county's practice is to approve, to process the payroll. In the event an approval did not happen before the payroll's processed, the payroll department follows up with the department for approval in there. In this case, either approval had not been obtained or was not retained in there. And so for a corrective action plan for this significant deficiency, the payroll department will follow up with the department director as the first step, if the issue cannot be resolved at that level, then it will be escalated to the finance director who will address with the department level or raise to county administration uh, the concern in there. As far as a timeline for implementation of this correction, the finance department has implemented it immediately as of the single audit report date, which was August 17th of 2022. The second significant deficiency related to disaster grants for public assistance in presidentially declared disasters, the winter storm as well as the wildfire, both fall under this category. The condition identified by the auditors identified five errors in the payroll calculation that resulted in the grant being incorrectly charged due to a lack of review in the payroll calculation in there. The cause is due to a manual calculation as part of the reporting in there. So it takes the actual data, but there was a manual calculation related to the reporting. There were no question costs related to either of these findings in there. It was noted there was maybe an undercharging of about $49 in total for the, the disasters declared in there. Corrective action related to this significant deficiency is the finance accountant will perform manual calculations in there, and then there will be an additional detail review of that performed by either the deputy director in finance, the accounting manager, or the grants manager as part of that. Again, this review um, is a process we've implemented as of the report date. Uh, August 17th, 2022. So both of the findings related to internal controls around allowable costs in there. So um, yes, I'd be happy to answer any questions or provide additional information. Well, of course, we'll accept the corrective action for the deficiencies. But Gary, I have a question about process. Why do we have to have a resolution to do this? State law. Okay. okay. Easy answer, state law. <laughs> do we need just to accept this? We don't need a motion. Well, just you'll, you'll put it on this Thursday's consent agenda, and that's where you would approve it or reject it. Okay, there. thank you very much. Great. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry for saying water environment services. I don't know. I, that good. was another issue a while back. It was all resolved. I apologize. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move back to the elected officials' consent agenda, the sheriff's office item, uh, which is item three, approval of a purchase through a cooperative procurement process to replace 60 Panasonic tough book laptop, laptops, docking stations, and DVD drives. Total value is $244,775. Funding is through budgeted county general funds. Nancy Artman is the finance manager of the sheriff's office. Welcome and go ahead, please. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Smith. Good morning. Administrator Schmidt, as stated, this is to replace 60 Panasonic tough books, docking stations, and DVD drives. This is for aged equipment that is past its useful life. We are using budgeted county general funds. Thank you. We've approved this in the budget already. This is just an additional addendum, correct? Yes. Any questions? Seeing no objections to this moving forward. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, very good. Now moving back to the consent, health, housing, and human services. Item one, approval to purchase one category E1 transit van from Sheck T Northwest Sales for the transportation, transportation Reaching People Program. Purchase is funded by PGE Drive Change Fund. Agreement through the Oregon Clean Fuels Program for $211,693. No county general funds are involved. Rod Cook, Director of Health, Housing, and Human Services. Go ahead, please. Yes, you might uh, remember this issue. This is, uh, we had a lot of conversation around 
electric vans, and we provided you with a lot of information on that. So you approved that back in uh, 62421. So this is the actual, we've received the grant now and we're ready to actually purchase. And so this uh, van would be used for elderly, um, riders, seniors, and individuals with disabilities throughout the county to medical appointments and other essential services, allowing them to remain in their homes and community through Clackamas County. Any questions or comments? Yes, we do. Commissioner Scholl. This uh, purchase, um, 211000 this is a, actually a gift from PGE. Yes, sir. As part of their, their introduction of electric vehicles into uh, the region. My question is, uh, are we set up to maintain such a vehicle, an electric vehicle like this? Well, we're, we'll be using our state and federal funds that are appropriate for this type of thing to pay for the cost of uh, maintaining the vehicles. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. Thanks. So, what about charging stations? <coughs> we have some here. We have some here. We don't have any Malala or Estacada or Sandy. I mean, I assume that it will be fully charged when they go into these rural areas. That's my whole issue with electric vehicles. This is a huge amount of money for a van. We could have bought another one for a fraction of what this costs. Yes, I am grateful for Portland General Electric. However, I am one person who is very doubtful and dubious about the use of electric vehicles uh, going forward. Uh, yeah, I remember you mentioning that, and so we did talk to the staff about uh, possibilities, and they thought there were a lot of charging stations along the route, so if they ever ran into issues, uh, that they would be, be able to recharge. But um, um, I think at some point we're all going to learn together as we as we usher out this whole age of electric vehicles. Um, I'm Is the seeing, federal government yeah. going to build our charging stations for us? Well, I, I Is can, it county general funds? Is it state funds? Is it mana, mana falling from heaven that's going to provide us with charging stations? I don't expect you to answer that, Rod, but it's a case of the horse before the cart, I believe, on this. Commissioner Savas, you're up. Yeah, just to let you know, this is a discussion that's happening in the transportation world quite a bit. And, yes, it is. And ODOT, and we, I believe, is receiving both federal and state monies and investing in charging station networks. And um, ideally, um, uh, it would spread around the state uh, in the rural areas as well, like along 97. A lot of the emphasis has been on I-5, you know, some mm -hmm. on the coast and then some here. You know, but, but I've been trying to push for, if you just put it there, also, you know, charging stations along Highway 97 as well, mm -hmm. um, and, and the east-west uh, routes um, to make, make that viable. But um, it is becoming more of a requirement that we that the progress is being made in order to receive federal funding. So it's almost a, uh, 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 a sign of the times. I'll just I, put it to you that way. Yeah, it's sign of the times. I, I just um, I think mandatory compliance is not the way to go. I think uh, there's going to be a push to force people into electric cars, and I am wholeheartedly against that for many, many reasons. Um, but that, I'll just leave my comments at that. Commissioner Schrader? Yeah, um, I was wondering, uh, Commissioner Savas, if you would be willing to give us a quick update white paper on what's been happening with this, because uh, Commissioner Smith is correct. The issue we're dealing with is um, it's a... I d good idea. I do think the future is going to be electric, but we do not have the infrastructure yet to really support that. And also, there's going to be the larger question of how the grid will support a transition from a fossil fuel based uh, <laughs> you know, transportation versus electric. So um, you're right. Commissioner, there's going to be some pretty significant infrastructure uh, issues that are going to have to be addressed. And my hope is that the federal government, uh, as it has in 
at least in the past, upon occasion, really stepped up to the plate if this is what we're going to do move forward with. Well, yeah, you talk about the grid, and that is the production of electricity in our state. And we've, all, we've been a big uh, dependent on hydropower, which is the best green energy power out there, contrary to what our state legislature has said. We've relied on solar wind and natural gas to produce our electricity uh, in a time when the demand for homes is increasing and business is increasing and now we're going to shift and take away our fossil fuels and think that we have enough electricity to power all That's of the vehicles uh, and you know, look at construction equipment look at farm equipment it's just a whole host of of items out there that it, it, to me it's not feasible Commissioner Savas, you're up. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're at a point in, in technology right no. now where um, this can be run around the country and we convert everything over tomorrow. But I'll just give you a teaser. Maybe there's a, a staff presentation we can do. Uh, I'll just give you a teaser. Right now, all of our cars are in the parking lot sitting. If they were all electric and they were all plugged in, that battery reserve is part of the well, is projected to be part of the grid. Meaning that, meaning that once your battery is charged, you've got that, that residual capacity, and, in, and sometimes in blackouts, the cars themselves, the batteries in the cars themselves are a reserve source. So that's part of the technology, as well as hydrogen is a big element. Very complex, but it's kind of exciting. That's but there's, there's a method to the madness, but uh, it's going to take years to get there. I'm glad you're excited. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. I've always, I've always said... Uh, and and I'll, 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 let me just take, take a liberty here. I've always said that the technology is going to solve this, this emissions crisis, you know, okay. and technology has solved a number of things, reduced it tremendously. You look at the air quality today, arguably is way better than it was 30 years ago. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think importantly, um, it's, it's a factor that when we talk about needing highway capacity, that, as I tell people, at one point in time, whether it's hydrogen, alternative fuels, electric, that th there will still be people driving back and forth to work and we still need cars mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. we still need highway capacity. Mm -hmm. So if we just forego that we're not going to be able to meet the air quality requirements, um, then that means they don't have a rationale to increase highway capacity for a growing economy and a population like we have here in Portland. Interesting. Thank you. Commissioner um, Schrader. And I don't want to get us too much off the off the grid here, pardon the pun, but I do want to mention as well, I think we should be watching California very closely. Oh, uh, definitely. Uh, Commissioner. That, that's going to influence yeah. the whole West Coast, and uh, yeah, uh, that remains to be seen how that's all going to play out. So anyway. That's right. Because they've requiring movement. Anyway, uh, I digress. I apologize. I'm uh, Gary Schmidt, done. you're up. You are off the grid, Commissioners. We I apologize. Are, but you know, we don't uh, get, we are ahead of schedule today. We're so ahead of schedule, and I'd like to keep it that way yes, because yes. we're doing so well, Commissioners. I'm, oh, not hear, okay. I'm not hearing support to go forward, so do you want to pull this item? No. No. Like, no. no. Okay. We're moving forward. Just we're we're going to move forward. It's going to be an experiment. We'll see what happens. You yeah. need to report back to this how well this is happening. If they run out of juice on their way up the mountain, if they're sidelined, or whatever. All right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Item two, <laughs> approval of a revenue agreement with Clackamas Workforce Partnership for Prosperity 10,000 Adult and Dislocated Workforce Services Funds to increase workforce services in Clackamas County. Total value is $149,999, funded through the Governor's Future Ready Organ Initiative. No county general funds are involved. Yes, um, uh, with your approval, CFCC will work with the, in close partnership with nonprofit organizations to provide wraparound and education training services to help individuals attain employment in their desired careers. Wow. Okay. Any objections to this moving forward? Seeing none. See, Gary, we made up for it on this side. Thank you. Thank you. You're right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, th item three, approval of an amendment to the Intergovernmental Grant Agreement from the Oregon Health Authority to add COVID and American Rescue Plan Act relief funds to current drug and alcohol prevention education and programming in Clackamas County. The amendment adds $221,986 for a maximum award amount of $1,548,236. No county general funds are involved. Yes, uh, if approved, this partnership helps support programs that provide prevention and school engagement activities and drug and alcohol prevention programming targeting middle and high school students. Any questions or comments? Seeing no objections to this. 
Item four, approval of an amendment to the 2022 amended and restated county-based services revenue agreement with Health Share of Oregon for public health and behavioral health care and services. The amendment removes language regarding payment reassessments. The total value remains $3,931,863, funded through the Oregon Health Plan. No county general funds are involved. Yes, and basically, as stated, this is a logistical change. A health share will no longer come back back twice a year for reassessment of payments. That's Questions or comments? Seeing no, objections. Item five, approval of a non-federal subrecipient blueprint grant with Providence Willamette Falls Medical Foundation for better outcomes through Bridges program. Total value is $74,663, funded through fiscal year 2022, restricted public health fund balance. No county general funds are involved. Yes, the uh, potential with this one is uh, it would uh, reduce emergency department visits for individuals with Medicaid who are experiencing mental health concerns. Uh, the program focuses on connecting and reducing barriers to accessing supportive services for BIPOC populations, those with limited English proficiency, individuals living in rural areas, and those with chronic health conditions. Any questions or comments? Seeing no objections to this moving forward. Item six, approval of a non-federal subrecipient grant agreement with Oregon Health Authority to implement a telehealth pilot program with school-based health clinics. Total value is $300,000, funded through the Adolescent and School Health Unity with the Oregon Health Authority. No county general funds are involved. Yes, the only thing I have to add to this one that uh, it would be the provider for the school-based health center in Estacada, Wade Creek Schools. So this is a rural opportunity for us. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item seven, approval of a revenue agreement with Oregon Primary Care Association for COVID treatment pilot program. Maximum value of, a, a, maximum value of the agreement is $250,000. Funded through the Oregon Primary Care Association. No county general funds are involved. Yes, this adds money to what we're already doing through the health centers. Um, it provides treatment for COVID-19 gaps exists in the larger county population. Health Centers does not currently have the staffing or procedures to serve residents who are, are not patients. So this basically adds capacity for what a service we're already providing. And this is a one-time uh, grant. A one-time grant. Yes. Questions or comments? Seeing none. Item eight, approval of an application to the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs for the annual allocation of County Veterans Service Office operational funds in the amount of $278,321. No county general funds are involved. Yes, if approved, uh, the focus of the work in the Veterans Services offices would be to assist veterans with obtaining service-connected disability benefits, needs-based pension, Veterans Affairs health, and other benefits earned through military service. Questions or comments? Seeing none. Item nine, approval of a grant agreement with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for the Homeless Management Information System, total grant award of $70,862, funding through a federal housing and urban development grant with a 25% match of supportive housing service <coughs> funds. No county general funds are involved. Yes, uh, housing and community development staff manages this database for partner agencies and utilizes the system to track outcomes, analyze data, and ensure appropriate use of HUD continuum of care grant funds by community members. This came before you as a uh, approval to apply, and mm -hmm. this is just us now implementing um, that application. We were successful. Okay. Uh, questions or comments? Could you give us an example, Rod? When, what kind of, what does this really mean on the ground with services? I, well, I could. I said, could you give us an example of what this really means on the ground with services? When a, when a vet comes into the office, whatever yeah. their needs might be, this is going to help us um, provide the service. Um, well, oh, this is the HM, you're talking about the HMS, I'm sorry. Uh, HMS is the tracking system that we okay. use for uh, anyone, any client using our housing system. That way we'd be able to track for you or give you data on uh, which part of the system they went into, okay. what services they were provided, and, and their out the outcomes if we've been okay. successful or not with their residency. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, seeing no objections. Item 10, approval of a grant agreement with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for continuum of care planning activities. Total award of $113,743, funded through a federal housing and urban development grant with a 25% match of supportive housing service funds. No county general funds are involved.
Yeah, these funds are used for a CLC um, community, uh, continuum of care. Planning activities include, include preparing, planning, and designing the CLC's annual application to HUD for homeless services, participating in the consolidated plan process, evaluating the outcomes of CLC projects, monitoring activities of the recipients of CLC funds to ensure compliance with program requirements, and managing the coordinated housing uh, access program, which is basically where residents can call this one number to access all of our housing uh, possibilities. Uh, any questions or comments? Gary, did we do number nine? Yes. We did. Yes. Okay. All right. Commissioner Shaw. On this number 10, is this a Clackamas County specific uh, operator that number that would be called to find out what's available? Yes, sir. You, you may get calls from individuals from Multnomah County or somewhere else, but however, this is for housing in Clackamas okay, County. Okay, good. All right. Okay, thanks. Okay, see no objections. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, transportation and development. <coughs> Item one, approval of an Approval of Oregon State Marine Board Boating Facility Grant Intergovernmental Agreement for the Boone's Ferry Boat Ramp Dock Replacement. Total value is $50,625. Funded through the Oregon State Marine Board. No county general funds are involved. Dan Johnson, Director of Transportation and Development. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Um, Boone Ferry Boat Ramp. It's been there for 25 years. It's wood. It's not in great shape. We have a grant opportunity for that, uh, to replace that. Uh, the grant agreement totals about $50,000, as you can see from your materials, uh, with an estimated total project cost of $246,000, approximately. Additional project funding will come from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife as a subrecipient grant in the amount of $151,000, and county parks will have a contribution of about $37,500, um, and an administrative match of $6,000. So essentially, this is an opportunity to go in there and repair that ramp um, that's been in disrepair for some time. Um, I have uh, Tom Riggs here from County Parks. If you have specific questions about the ramp and its condition, um, be happy to answer any questions you might have. Where is this located? Uh, Boone's Ferry Boat Ramp is down off I-5 there on the east side. Of the Willamette River? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Hey, I Am I thinking it. of the right one as we go over the uh, Willamette River, uh, River Mile 38.5? Is that the Boone's Bridge? It's, you see it's it driving. The Boone's yep. Bridge and the Railroad Bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so my question is um, why are we doing this? It's ours. We own this? Yes, yeah. it's why? County Park. It's County Park, yeah. It's part of County Parks. That's the County Park down there? One of our public boat ramps. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Yep. Just curious. Yep. Just That's some pretty accurate information. What was that mile post again? 38.5. Yeah, right. Just okay, right. <laughs> All righty. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Mile post 38.5 on the river. That's Mark Twain might be interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Uh, any objections to this going forward? Seeing none, thank you very much. Item two, approval of a board order authorizing purchases from Overdrive for digital library content. Total value is $2,790,000 through the year 2032, funded through library support services budget and reimbursed by library cities. No county general funds are involved. So bear with me. The library work is new to me, <laughs> but in short, um, essentially in 2005, the libraries in Clackamas County link um, are a cooperative member in the Oregon Digital Library Consortium. And um, we purchase ebooks, e audio on behalf of library patrons uh, throughout the state. Um, and that's coordinated through li Library Supportive Services, which is now a part of DTD. Don't, no smirking. I'm, make, I'm rolling with this. Um, just so you understand, the contract amount sounds like a lot, but in short, there was a contract approved back in uh, 2019 with a company called Overdrive Inc. Um, to the tune of about $45,000 a year for 10 years. Secondly, there was another contract approved in 2019 with a company called um, Biblio Bibliotheca LLC uh, for about $205,000 a year. In short, what this new contract does is replace those contracts. It consolidates those contracts into one provider, which is Overdrive. Um, there is a slight increase to the cost, and the increase is um, the addition of 
um, e-magazine collection to the tune of 17,500, and then some additional um, uh, ODLC participation dollars. Basically, it went from um, 56,500 to 45,000. Again, these dollars are then um, um, are, are paid back from the city library system. Mm -hmm. So basically it's a payment we make and then we recoup those dollars back into the program. Okay. I'd be happy to answer the questions you might have. Thank you, Dan, I appreciate this. Yes, this is a new assignment for your department, I know that. Any further questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item three, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with Portland State University for the annual population estimates for the former city of Damascus. Total value is $27,013, funded through the Damascus Road Fund. No county general funds are involved. Okay, so um, Administrator Schmidt so eloquently talked about the former city of Damascus. Um, so in short, Damascus disincorporated um, on July 17, uh, 2016. As a part of that, legislation enacted after that disincorporation, Clackamas County was entitled to receive the share of dollars that were gone to Damascus um, for a period of 10 years following the disincorporation. The state mandates that PSU does population estimates for all counties and incorporated cities. Doesn't speak to disincorporated cities. So in short, those population um, estimates dictate funding and a number of different resources, how those are allocated. So in short, we have to do an IGA with Portland State University to have them do a population analysis um, for that area that was formerly known as Damascus to assess what that population is um, so that we are then provided those funds um, that we in turn in DTD, we have a Damascus road fund program, so we keep those funds separate. So all those monies that um, would have gone geographically to the city of Damascus or former city of Damascus, we keep those in a separate fund from the rest of our monies and program those monies specifically in that geographic boundary. Uh, so there's no commingling of funds within um, our, our transportation system. Essentially, this is the basis for which we then we can then um, have the state provide those funds to us for use for former city of Damascus residents. Again, something we we you rarely deal with, but. Questions or comments? Uh, just one, Dan, yep. at so, some point, the uh, former city of Damascus mm -hmm. uh, becomes unincorporated from the road department standpoint with this tax, when, when is that? Uh, well, we only get those dollars um, 10 years, so it would be 2026. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And we have plans to use those dollars. We have a program, um, most, most of it's maintenance, in all honesty, and some safety improvements, um, but those dollars are programmed for expenditure in the upcoming years. Okay, thank okay. you. Seeing no objections. Oh, Commissioner Scholl. Uh, Dan, how many? How much money remains in the Damascus Road Fund? Is it, it can't be too much money? Eh? Uh, off the top of my head, I have to get the exact away, number back it's, to you. It's um, something that's going to go away pretty soon, though, isn't it? You're gonna, uh, yeah, you're yes. Burn those dollars up. We we are going to burn through those dollars and use those dollars in that geographic area. Um, as Commissioner Saba said, those dollars um, terminate in 2026. So I would assume that our work would um, probably terminate somewhere around 27, 28, give or take. Um, but we have those pro dollars programmed. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and, but some of those dollars are still coming in under the guise of oh, the, the they, former, former city. So that, that money's been replenished all the correct. time until 2026. Correct. So. Correct. And so our job to ensure they are spent in that area. Okay, thank you very much. See no objections to this. Gary? Uh, finally, disaster management item one, approval to apply for a fiscal year 2023 emergency management performance grant between Clackamas County and the state of Oregon. The estimated value is $166,327. Funding is through the state of Oregon Department of Emergency Management. No county general funds are involved. Daniel Nybauer, Interim Director of Disaster Management. Go ahead, please. Good morning, commissioners. This grant uh, we get uh, every year provides Funding up to 50% of pre-identified uh, staff costs. The, var the funding varies year to year. This year, uh, we've been allocated uh, approximately $166,327. Uh, if other jurisdictions decide not to apply, then that funding may go up, although most jurisdictions do apply. Um, so uh, that is the, uh, that is the uh, request to apply for these funds for this year. Thank you. As a matter of fact, disaster management is a core county service provided for in Oregon Constitution, correct? Yes. 
Yes, I believe it is, and it's nice that at least they're helping out a little bit with the funding. Mm -hmm. Mr. Scholl. Uh, sir, uh, how are you going to use this money? For is staff for costs. Personnel, uh, program expansion, how is it going to be used? For personnel, we help okay. uh, cover staff costs. Seeing no objections to this moving forward, thank you. That is, thank you, that's your consent agenda items. All of these will be on tomorrow, Thursday, September 8th, business meeting for your approval or not. Uh, next, Regional Toll Advisory Committee Charter Comments. Commissioner Savas will lead this topic and there also was a memo from him in your packet. Yeah, I'll just be really brief. We had the first meeting here a couple of weeks ago and um, along with the packet, accompanying the packet was a charter and unlike anything I've seen in 25 years of um, committees, um, they were requesting signatures from all the members um, agreeing that some of the statements or decisions were um, in fact decisions and cast in stone and then we would move forward. And, and some of those things were actually in conflict with our value statement on tolling. So um, I just uh, simply, we put together a few things and staff and staff and helped uh, work on this. Other jurisdictions are of, have similar concerns, so we won't be alone. Okay. This is just a letter on the backside identifying some of that and, and just wanted to keep you apprised of what's going on. No, per, no, no decision per se, but I'm happy to take any questions. It's not clear actually what the scope of the committee will be because they, we thought perhaps, for example, that tolling rates would be determined or discussed and decided by this group, but they have shifted that to another group entirely, unknown group statewide. Uh, the Oregon Transportation Commission, we just lost one of our local members, uh, Alondo Simpson. Um, so now, instead of having two people from the Portland metro area, we only have one. So just, again, just apprising you, and I'm just going to continue to do what we can. But fortunately, we're not alone on this, okay. on some of these issues. ODOT being the chair of the committee, conflict of interest. So ODOT having a, a vote at the table, conflict of interest. So. Absolutely. So this email that you've composed, I assume, with staff, you're going to send that? Yep. Okay. And when do you think you'll send that? Uh, I think today's the deadline, so yes, they'll go today. today. Today or tomorrow's the deadline. Yeah. yeah. Commissioners, I think this is really important. Um, it's such a moving target. Uh, the rules have changed, but wait a minute. You would have to have rules to begin with to have them changed. So there have been no rules. And you're right in the Oregon Transportation Commission was the one that was going to set tolling, and now they're not. I thought that was provided for in statute. You know, somebody really needs to enlighten me on what the heck ODOT is doing. It sounds like it's we're kind of the Wild West show with this tolling business in Clackamas County. And um, if they can go outside statute, and take the tolling authority away from the Oregon Transportation Commission. I have a lot of heartburn about that. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure that's exactly what's happening. But it's it's also I won't say a deliberate moving target. But things keep on changing. So what we think is what going to be, you know, as ODOT puts out, they're going to be doing X. Right. And then X changes. So I think that they're learning as they're going. Right. And they're building the plane as they're, they're as they're flying yeah, it. Flying by the season. Okay, Commissioner uh, Scholl, you're up. <laughs> Yes, uh, you know, in the 20 months that I've been a commissioner, this issue on tolling has come up and we've communicated to ODOT. Uh, our cities in the county have communicated to ODOT their concerns. But like Commissioner Sava says, even today uh, in September 2022, we still have confusion, a lack of clarity from ODOT on just exactly how tolling is going to work. Now, I've got to say this. I, I've spoken to uh, some folks from Salem. One of them was, is a member of the Oregon Budget Committee who said that the money to complete the I-205 improvements is there in Salem if the legislature just had the will to appropriate the money accordingly. And I read your letter, uh, Commissioner Savas, I thought it was outstanding. Uh, but my concern is that the letter uh, 
at least indirectly, concedes to the idea that tolling is coming to I-205 in Clackamas County. And I know I might sound like a man adrift at sea just clinging on to my life raft uh, on this, but I, I, I just want to state one more time that uh, I believe that we need to continue to state that we do not accept the idea of tolling on I-205 and the uh, submission of our people to tolling in view of the fact that ODOT is still so unclear as to how this is going to work, what it's going to cost. Um, we know, and I've heard you speak many times, Commissioner Safas, about diversion, but and I've and I've heard uh, Metro uh, say they're going to work with TriMet to see what they can do. But the fact is that no amount of mass transit is going to stop diversion when this happens if tolling is uh, forced onto our residents and those our neighbors in the region. And not just that, but all interstate trucking and everybody who comes along the West Coast is going to be subject to this. So again, I, I, I say this just, I feel compelled to say one more time that I believe we need to resist, continue to resist the idea of tolling and demand another solution, no matter how hard that solution might be, it will be easier than what's going to happen to our people once tolling begins. So again, finally, your letter, I liked it very much, but I think we need to just state that one more time, we don't accept what's being offered in the way of tolling by ODOT. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner uh, Savas. Yeah, yeah, just to follow up very briefly, and that is that uh, I agree, and it is somewhat of a concession, especially if we sign the document, um, the charter as is, with all those statements in there, which again, as I mentioned, contradict really and uh, conflict with our value statement. So I'm suggesting we don't just send this letter, but also again, once again, accompany our value statement to, to the mailing as well, so that they're, they're assured of that. Um, that our, where our position is. And uh, we can talk about that, go on and on and on, but what's happening, Merrill, <coughs> Metro's doing a, a, a parallel process on tolling right now, making rules, uh, which are, I think, more, more concerning than what ODOT's doing. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk about that another time. I don't want to really confuse it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. But we're going to continue to, to, to fight for our citizens, and, and I'm going to honor what, um, what we, our position and stance has been with that value statement. Thank you. Yes, that value statement is very good. Commissioner Fisher. So I just want to make sure I got it, what's going on here. You are appealing basically through this email the suggested bylaws which are have conflicts of interest by who's suggested to be the chair because of them being the director of ODOT and just that's what this email is about, right? And that's what you're wanting to share with us today. That, that's part of it as well as some of the statements in fact which they want to cement in, which is really the concessions of the, of the tolling that Commissioner Scholl was okay. speaking to. And that is on additionally, ODAT has limited the committee's scope by, okay, so, on that whole piece. So, got it. That's great. Thank you. Okay. So I want to ask you about what Commissioner Scholl just said. So what I, how I understand how the region is looking at this is that congestion pricing, and I'm not talking about tolling to pay for I-205, but I'm talking about congestion pricing, is good policy to control the way people drive, not control, but to influence it so that we don't have so much congestion in the region as we continue to grow. But I really appreciate what Commissioner Scholl is saying. So if everybody's the best thinking is congestion pricing is a good idea, but tolling a particular area at the expense of a certain population, which is Clackamas County, it doesn't have right. any other alternatives and tolling first to pay for something, I really want to explore just what Commissioner Scholl said of there being other funding sources. Because we've um, heard, I mean, you hear from our congressional delegation, now unfortunately, I mean, Kurt Schrader's not going to be there to fight for us this next time. We've got to 
get with whoever is going to be those two congressional candidates right now, I believe, while they're running for office to say, look, this is really important. We need you on board um, on this issue federally. But also, we've heard from Senator Merkley, Senator Ron Wyden, that this that holding Clackamas County first isn't a good policy perspective either. So I'm interested in all possible federal dollars, and I know that our staff is on, on top of this and looking at it, but I would really like to present another funding option with to not have to use tolling. Tolling, that's taking money from a certain area to pay for a specific project, which is, as we know, regional, state, federal, highway. This isn't just a Clackamas County road that we're talking about here. So where are we at with that, Paul? How can we take our value statements, which we've been so clear on, and translate that into? Yeah, well, I would say that, um, Commissioner Fisher, that I would not go so far as to say that congestion pricing is necessarily a good thing, OK? Um, there's two motives for congestion pricing. So I wouldn't go that far. I would actually be more, more, more rigid in that personally. But um, getting back, you did sign, we did agree to a letter that we sent asking the OTC to consider using the one point was it $1.6 billion, I think, believe, of that they got an allocation for the feds. Mm -hmm. They could have used that money to fund the project. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was another, that was, that's one example of a source. Um, but I will, I, I will, um, I will say that the, on the congestion pricing, the two motives or the two obje objectives are to change people's behavior. Right. And the other one is to reduce congestion essentially, as in, in lieu of perhaps adding capacity elements, you know, that maybe we actually really need for a growing economy. So getting back to the, to the uh, what's important for us, for the behavior change, which is primarily the number one reason promoted, that's fine if you actually have alternatives and, motive, and modes for people to, to change their behavior too. And, and those are absent here and there's no means of providing that. So therefore, yeah. therefore, it doesn't make any sense um, to us. And we know we need capacity. We're, we're, our economy is growing. Mm -hmm. um, and, Absolutely. And this congestion pricing should not be a, a method in lieu of building the needed capacity. Thank you uh, for taking the time to bring us up to date on this topic. Yep, thank you. We, we appreciate so it very much. We're, we're good to go when in accompanying our value statement with this letter. Commissioners, do we see any objections to Commissioner Savas sending that letter via email? No, I just like what Commissioner Shaw said about reiterating the alternatives to it and keeping that forefront. Yeah, and I, I do want to say that this is not about the total, this is really about the charter specifically. Yeah, I know. So, so this, it's, it's specific to that. I know. Yeah. I just it's trying it's to frame to it. Keep that, hounding that message. Okay. You know well, I was just going to say take a highlighter and highlight our value statement. <laughs> just make sure they get the picture. Thank you. Yep. Staff are listening. Thanks. Yeah, I see no objections. I see no corrections to your letter, Commissioner Savas. Okay, good to go. Thank yep, you. I think we're good to go on that. Very well done. Yeah, Gary. Thank you. Well, commissioners, you are so amazing. You have plowed through an agenda that I thought was going to take you all day. All you have left for the rest of today is commissioner communications. So I have a question for you. You do have items for tomorrow scheduled. We can bump all of those to this afternoon. So you can meet this afternoon from 1.30 to 2.30 and not tomorrow. Or we can cancel this afternoon session and have you meet tomorrow as scheduled. I'm from one, I'm sorry, 1 to 2 p.m. tomorrow. What would you like to do? Well, commissioners, we have a House 52 appointment. At what time is that, Gary? It's at 3 o'clock today. Okay, do you think that we can get through what we need to get through between 1.30 and 3 or maybe 1 o'clock and 3? I'm just throwing ideas out, commissioners. Right. You've been so great today. I do think you can get through what's left. I, I think we possibly can. Commissioner Savas? Yeah, I would like to do it today and get it done. Um, I have a, actually have a memorial service tomorrow oh. afternoon, so I won't be able to be here tomorrow afternoon at and the, at the 1 o'clock. Likewise, I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow afternoon as well. So if we could do it today, commissioners, uh, we start at 1. We work to get what we can get finished, and uh, then we are set up to do our House 52 appointment process. Okay. Commissioner Fisher, are you okay? I'm just checking. All right. And Commissioner I Schrader? I'm absolutely fine. Just boring. Yeah, that's through. fine. I'm going to be going straight through. I have a one at noon to one, but I'm, he I can, I'm okay. here. All so. Right. All righty. So let's do that. That sounds like fun. All right. We'll start at 1 p.m. today, and we'll do tomorrow's yes. items today, and we'll cancel then tomorrow's afternoon session. 
Thank you very okay. much, Gary. Good idea. And uh, we have Commissioner Communications up. Uh, I'll just start down the line. Commissioner Savas, you're up first. Well, I did a lot of work, actually. As I mentioned earlier, I attended the first regional tolling committee um, meeting here um, in the middle of our break. And I've been working uh, quite a bit answering calls from folks and meeting with people that um, are concerned about this and or sit around the table at this regional tolling committee. So the conversations are happening. Um, there is, uh, in that, in light of that, I do want to say that, that, you know, if you look at the membership of some of the people around that committee, um, the Oregon Truckers Association, for example, Portland Business Alliance, for example, um, they want to see these projects happen. And I, I, I don't disagree. We want to see the Rose Quarter be fixed. We want to see the capacity being built. And I would, I've, I've, I've really kind of been saying we, what we all seem to be worried about is that they might be making some of these bridges brought to seismic standards, but not to capacity standards for the mm -hmm. future. Right. So is there the assurance that, that they'll actually build? There are some people that are willing um, to pay tolls, uh, provided that they get the improvement, but there's no assurances that will ever happen. Because if Metro's on a parallel path of guiding rules and they are the approving body for funds, it could be a scenario where ODOT says, yes, we want to add a lane here, let's say, and Metro could say, no, 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 you're not going to add that lane. So that's, that's on the horizon coming, and I'll be talking to you about that. But, um, and I think that, is, that would be a shame, uh, frankly, uh, that it's not really coordinated. Not, and don't want to get too far in the weeds, but that's, uh, that's a red flag for me. Folks, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Savas. Commissioner Schrader. Uh, yeah, I would uh, just like to let folks know yesterday, uh, on coming back, I had uh, a first meeting in the Economic Development and Workforce Committee of folks. It's not on. Okay, Committee of NACO. Uh, I am the chair of that. So yesterday, uh, uh, with the leadership of uh, Mike Matthews, who is our ledge director on this, I met with our leadership team of all of the vice chairs in the area. And the, the point of that particular meeting was to take a look at the kinds of things uh, we would be addressing this year. Uh, under our, our leadership, myself, with the vice chairs. And uh, we spoke about everything from housing to arts and culture, economic mobility, resiliency and touch climate change, uh, workforce development, uh, <coughs> relationships, our, our um, relationships with the, the Department of Commerce and the Department of Labor, labor apprenticeships, uh, chambers in the private sectors, how we're going to be uh, working with those, community development block grants, home funding, and uh, basically uh, looking at working more closely with human services. Uh, and I know Commissioner Sh Fisher will probably mention this as it comes to looking at uh, child care capacity so uh, people can return to work. That was one of the things. And then looking at uh, international uh, trade and how we could actually continue to do some programming with those committees. Uh, the other thing that we decided was that uh, we had chairs and vice chairs of three subcommittees, workforce, uh, economic development, and housing. Uh, we will be looking to those subcommittees to come forward with at least two resolutions per uh, committee that we can present and run through Congress. One of the things that we do in this committee is to uh, lobby Congress on issues of import to economic and workforce development. So as these initiatives and these resolutions are moving forward, uh, I'd like to make sure that our legislative folks are aware of them so it will actually increase our capacity to lobby for the dollars we need for these issues uh, as we move forward. And um, Chair Smith, one of the things that's happening as we uh, head out to DC, I'll be having our first full committee meeting at NACO on December uh, 14th in their offices um, at 3 p.m. And we will go through technical questions, legislative administration updates, upcoming events, funding uh, opportunities. We'll be talking about September being National Workforce Development Month. 
and we are going to be asking counties across the nation to compile and highlight examples of county ARPA workforce development investments. And so I'm also going to propose that we talk to, I think that what we did with our local chambers here is phenomenal in terms of setting up those economic recovery centers. And so I'd like to gather data on that and have that be part of the NACO portfolio of how we managed uh, helping those businesses uh, moving forward and survive the pandemic and so on and so forth. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I'm gonna be delighted, um, uh, Chair Smith, to have you. I'd like to have you meet Mike Matthews and maybe uh, the, uh, Sonia, perhaps the director, uh, the <coughs> legislative director of human services, make a connection with Matt Chase. So uh, we can really let people know this is a valuable function of our county at the national level that will help us succeed and actually being one of a, what I call a beacon county. And that is a county that uh, actually consistently gets awards at the national level for the innovations that we come up with there and how we serve our public. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. The other thing I was hoping you would mention is we, we visited Vigor Yep. Uh, yesterday, it used to be yep. Oregon Ironworks. We're continuing to make uh, other contacts with some of our larger businesses. I've been to Precision Cast Parts, uh, Vigor, uh, what used to be Blunt, but is now Oregon Tool to get a sense of you know, what they need. And it hasn't changed very much in that it's workforce, 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 skilled uh, people that can weld, that can build things that are computer literate. And so it's just giving us that push to know that that is uh, still an issue, will continue to be an issue. And uh, particularly there's a gap between about the 30 to the 40 something. She yes. tells that, yeah, mm -hmm. that was a very interesting thing. And we got to see, uh, fabulous things that they're building. I mean, absolutely. Without telling trade secrets. Without telling trade secrets. You, ha you have to have security clearance. They do a lot of Department of Defense work uh, there. And so they are uh, part of our uh, defense infrastructure. Uh, and actually, um, I don't think I'm giving away any secrets in that they, I imagine they will also be uh, sending things over to uh, Ukraine through some of their uh, work that they've been doing. The amount yeah. of high quality steel that they use in their manufacturing plant is tremendous. And the products they make from that, and they, and I'm just, uh, sorry. Like, we got, yeah, we were excited. Yeah, we were so, excited. Yeah, and yeah. of course I have a farm background and, and, and stuff like that. And so manufacturing, and you know, Paul knows this too from his business. You know, you, you have to build things on the spot. You have to be able to have the skills to do it. And he says, you know, we need a skilled labor force and people coming out of colleges and so forth. And it kind of piggies backs on something that, that I want to do with our lottery dollars that I'll discuss right. later. But <clears throat> he says they need a skilled workforce in the age group that Martha's talking about. And um, the it, and it's changed and the thinking has changed. He said, of course, we know the baby boomers are retiring. And one of the astute observations he made, he says, we used to manage our workforce by giving them more overtime. And then we didn't bring on new people mm -hmm. and train them. And now we're seeing a training deficit because the baby boomers are retiring and we need mentors. And he says, and I have to have a shout out. I'm very proud of this. He says, you can send me welders from Malala High School every day of the week. He <laughs> says, that's my very first priority in hiring because they graduate from high school with top, top welding skills. And the welding has to be very precision. And on one operation, he says, you take a hair and you split that hair six times. And that is how accurate some of our measurements have to be. And it's just, it's just tremendous. It was very exciting yeah. for both Martha and I to go out there yesterday and see that. And they were very generous uh, with their information towards us. And, so. And I relived my old PNDC days. They are an active member of the Pacific Northwest yeah. Defense Coalition. Very good. And they've invited us to um, visit them whenever we can. We'll, we'll have to do that. We'll, we'll, we'll plug in for that. Commissioner okay. Fisher, you're up. Yeah. So glad to be back. It's good to see everyone. Looking forward to, this is a heavy schedule we've got. So that's all I have to report. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Scholl. Yes, I'd like to uh, do a couple of shout outs. I'd like to thank uh, 
the uh, Clackamas County Fair Board for a fabulous fair this year. I had more fun there. They, they did a great job. Also, I'd like to thank the residents of Clackamas County for their fire safety awareness. We've got this far this year with no major fires in the county. We have a few more weeks to go before those rains come. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Friday through Saturday, I understand we're gonna have a high wind uh, situation. Uh, people, please be careful, just a few more weeks. Uh, also, I'd like to remind everybody that September is Suicide Prevention Month. No one in Clackamas County needs to feel alone. We have many uh, services in the county to help people who feel uh, they need to talk to somebody. Uh, our, our Clackamas County Mental Health Services are very, uh, very well set up to talk to people. Also, I encourage folks to uh, get on our county website and learn about how to identify somebody who might be suffering from a, or displaying a suicidal tendencies. Be aware, and uh, also MPAC, I'll brief you on that tomorrow morning. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner Shull. Uh, yes, as uh, chair, I worked some of the vacation too, although we did get away to a lake. Thank you very much. It was very refreshing and invigorating. Um, the Clackamas County Fair attendance, I understand, was the largest ever. And I think it may have been the most profitable fair ever. Uh, of course, we attended Tuesday the opening ceremonies, and I attended um, the show for, see, the uh, showing of pigs and sheep because I have friends who have uh, FF, FFA program children in there. I also attended on Saturday morning the livestock auction. And holy cow, you talk about money being thrown around. I think I was able to raise my car, card once in a futile effort because the bids just went crazy. One steer sold for $13,000. And that goes directly to, you know, the, the, the kids showing it. And so what has happened is we have a lot of corporate sponsors attend these auctions. And from what I hear, uh, the livestock auctions at fairs in other counties. A lot of corporate uh, entities are attending because this is the future of their workforce, Martha. Yep. They want to understand, they have the kids understand that these companies will pay and they like the work ethic and the attentiveness of the kids who come to fair and FFA programs because because that is the workforce that are seeking to develop. They know how to work. Yeah, they know how to work. Mm -hmm. They understand responsibility, being on time, uh, respect. And so they're really grooming them quite early on, and I find that very interesting. That's what I was told by uh, several corporate sponsors that I talked to with. Well, seeing no other further business before this commission, we will recess and reconvene at 1 p.m. this afternoon. 1.30? One o'clock. Oh, one one o'clock. Okay. Yeah, one o'clock. It's off on my calendar. Okay, that's fine. All righty. Thank you very much.